When you read the Hong Kong preliminary report line by line, the most shocking part isn't that a Boeing 747 slid off a runway and into the water. It's that the data quietly exposes a weak spot in how we operate, aging wide bodies write our checklists and sign off mail items every single day. The NTSB has now joined Hong Kong's investigators on this case, and that tells you this is no local anomaly, it's a global systems problem the industry can't afford to ignore. In this video, I'm going to walk you through what the prelim actually reveals, what it implies about 747 thrust control and crew training, and why this accident should change how we think about routine cargo operations everywhere. Let's start with what the document really tells us once you strip away the headlines. Hong Kong's Air Accident Investigation Authority is the lead agency here with the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board and Turkish investigators formally on board as accredited representatives. That alone is significant. When the NTSB sends a team overseas, it's because the case has important implications for the aircraft type for U.S. manufacturers and for global operations, not just for one airport or one airline. The report confirms a few core facts. The 747 freighter arrived from Dubai at night, touched down on runway 07 left, and began a rollout that for the first seconds looked completely routine. The weather runway lighting and navigation equipment were all normal. There were no distress calls and no last-minute changes to the approach. From a systems perspective, nothing in the environment forced this accident to happen. What the prelim quietly underscores is that the drama began only after touchdown when the aircraft was supposed to be in its safest, most controlled phase. The automatic braking system disconnected. The crew switched to manual braking and then one outboard engine on the right wing advanced into strong forward thrust while the other three were configured to slow the airplane. That asymmetric power condition is the heart of the case. Two airport security staff in a patrol vehicle outside the runway fence were killed when the deviating aircraft struck their vehicle and pushed it into the water and the 747 itself broke up after going through the perimeter and ending partially submerged. The crew survived, which means investigators have access to both flight data recordings and human testimony. The report doesn't assign blame or list causes that comes later, but it gives enough detail that we can see the outlines of a much bigger story about engine control design, maintenance, oversight, and training. To understand why investigators in the NTSB are so focused on that right-hand engine, you have to look at how thrust is actually commanded on a 747. From a pilot's point of view, you push a lever forward and the engine produces more thrust. Under the skin, there's a lot more going on. On a Dash 400 series freighter, each thrust lever is mechanically linked to a set of sensors and to an electronic engine control unit, the EEC that interprets lever position, ambient conditions, and engine limits to schedule fuel flow and target a certain fan speed. The pilots don't fly raw fuel valves, they fly demand signals that the EEC turns into N1 and N2 targets. As long as the system is healthy lever angle and engine power stay tightly correlated, the reverser system adds another layer. When the crew selects reverse on a given engine, they're commanding the EEC and the reverser actuators to work together. Fan airflow is redirected thrust is deflected forward and the control logic shifts into a mode designed to produce drag instead of forward acceleration. Regulators allow aircraft to depart with a thrust reverser inoperative because braking and spoilers do most of the work on landing. Reversers are classified as a performance aid, not a primary safety system. That was the case here. The right outboard engine's reverser was locked out under the minimum equipment list so it could provide forward thrust, but not reverse. What makes this accident so concerning is that the preliminary report shows a divergence between what you'd expect from a decelerating 747 and what engine number four actually did. The thrust levers for the other three engines were retarded and their reversers were used during rollout. But the post-accident cockpit inspection found the number four lever pushed fully forward with its reverser stowed and the recorded engine parameters show it delivering power comparable to a takeoff setting while the airplane was already on the ground. That raises a narrow but critical question. Did something in the control path from mechanical linkage to sensor to EEC command that power, or did the engine produce it without a matching command at the quadrant? The answer matters far beyond this one accident because it goes directly to how much redundancy and fault detection we really have in legacy throttle architectures.
On paper, dispatching with a single inoperative reverser on a four-engine aircraft is fully legal and common. The minimum equipment list exists to keep the system moving if an item isn't considered critical for safety operators are permitted to fly, while it's deferred for maintenance under defined limits. That logic has a lot of merit. Without it, airlines would cancel huge numbers of flights over relatively minor discrepancies. But the Hong Kong 747 accident is a case study in how a perfectly legal MEL item can interact with an unexpected failure mode to create a situation the rules never really contemplated. The outboard right engine that surged forward was also the only one that could not produce reverse thrust. In most scenarios, that's manageable. Crews adjust landing technique performance numbers are recalculated, and the aircraft stops just fine using brakes, spoilers, and the remaining reversers. Where the risk changes, is when that same engine suddenly goes to very high forward power during rollout. Now you've concentrated both the extra capability and the failure on the same side of the aircraft. It's no longer just one reverser in-op. It's a potential single point where a control anomaly, a mechanical jam, or an input error can translate directly into a huge yawing force on the ground. This is where regulators and operators may have to ask harder questions after the final report. Should there be additional constraints when a MEL item affects the same engine that later becomes critical in the accident sequence? Should dispatch policies for older wide bodies be tightened when they're operating into wet, contaminated, or geometrically constrained runways? And just as importantly, are crews being given enough scenario-based training to appreciate how an otherwise benign MEL entry can become a major factor when multiple things go wrong at once? None of this means MELs are unsafe as a concept. But Hong Kong shows how they can quietly stack risk in ways that only become obvious after the fact. If you talk to line pilots and instructors about engine failures, most will immediately think about a V1 cut on takeoff or a loss of thrust during the initial climb. Simulators around the world are full of those scenarios because they're classic, high-stakes events that crews absolutely must be prepared for. What you almost never see is a 747 rolling out after a stable landing when one outboard engine suddenly accelerates toward maximum takeoff power on its own. That's the kind of out-of-family failure this accident highlights. It's technically imaginable but so rare that it often sits outside the mental model both crews and trainers use when they think about threats on landing. The preliminary report tells us that by the time the power surge developed, the aircraft was already decelerating and the crew had transitioned to manual braking. On paper, you still have multiple control tools, nose wheel steering rudder authority that tapers off with speed and asymmetric braking. In real life at night, after a long duty period and with a large uncommanded yaw building as the outboard engine spools up, recognizing exactly what's happening and choosing the right response in a couple of seconds is incredibly demanding. Traditional training tends to assume that thrust settings on the ground are either symmetrical or deliberately asymmetrical in a way the crew understands. Here, most of the Q's engine indications, acceleration directional drift, arrive almost at once. This is where the safety value of this accident could ultimately lie. Once investigators pin down whether the thrust increase was driven by a control system issue, a mechanical problem, or something else, regulators and airlines can start building that exact scenario into recurrent training. Not as a scare tactic, but as a way to hardwire crews to recognize the signature of a runaway thrust event on the ground and to practice decisive responses while there's still runway ahead, rejecting reverse on the other engines, closing all thrust levers, maximizing braking, and using every available steering input. The odds of any given crew facing this are tiny. The impact of one more crew being prepared if it ever happens again is enormous. There's another truth buried in this case that doesn't fit neatly into a graph or a cockpit diagram. This was a 32-year-old converted passenger jet working a nighttime cargo run, operated by a relatively small carrier on behalf of a major global brand. That combination older wide bodies conversion programs and subcontracted flying is standard in the cargo world. It also means that a lot of the 747s still flying today are doing their work far from the public eye in the off-peak hours under schedules that are tightly tuned to logistics demand. For many operators, MELs are part of how you keep that system moving. Every deferral is supposed to be managed inside a safety management framework, but there is always commercial pressure in the background. This Hong Kong crash is also not the first time this particular operator has been involved in a fatal accident. 
In 2017, one of its 747 crashed on approach to Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, killing dozens of people on the ground after a badly flown landing and poor visibility. Different airport, different weather, different chain of events, but from a safety system standpoint, multiple fatal accidents in less than a decade are a red flag that regulators and customers will study closely. When the NTSB and other authorities look at this latest crash, they won't just be looking at one engine or one landing roll. They'll be asking how maintenance is structured, how internal audits work, how crews are trained and checked, and whether the operator's safety culture is truly robust enough for this kind of complex high-energy operation. At the same time, it's important not to single out one airline and ignore the bigger picture. The economic model of global cargo relies heavily on older airframes that have been converted and kept in service far beyond what most passengers ever see. Those airplanes can be operated safely, many are, but they demand a very disciplined approach to maintenance configuration control and training. A case like Hong Kong serves as a stress test for that entire system. It forces everyone involved, manufacturers, regulators, leasing companies, and customers to ask whether the safeguards around these older fleets are keeping up with reality on the line. So what is the shocking truth behind this crash if we look past the headline that one engine went to full thrust on rollout? It's that the accident didn't come out of nowhere. It came from the intersection of several structural assumptions the industry makes every day, that MEL deferred items are low risk, that thrust control systems will always follow their inputs, that crews will never see certain combinations of failures, and that older converted freighters will keep doing their jobs indefinitely as long as they pass the next inspection. The Hong Kong preliminary report doesn't tell us why engine number four accelerated, but it clearly shows that when it did, the defenses in place were not enough to keep the aircraft on the runway or to protect the people working beside it. Once the technical cause is nailed down, the real value of this investigation will be in the corrective actions that follow. On the engineering side, that could mean closer scrutiny of throttle quadrant mechanics, better fault monitoring in electronic engine controls, or even logic that limits thrust under certain on-ground conditions if the commanded configuration doesn't match what the system is sensing. On the operational side, we may see tighter MEL policies, when reversers or thrust control components are deferred especially for older jets operating into airports with water slopes or obstacles off the end of the runway. And on the human factor side, this accident is a strong argument for expanding simulator profiles to include rare but high consequence events like post-landing thrust runaways and extreme ground handling asymmetries. For now, we are still in the fact-gathering phase. The AAIA controls the investigation and the NTSB and other agencies are there to support test and challenge the technical work. When the next report is released, whether it's an interim update or the final conclusions, we'll revisit this case and look at what the investigators actually found in the engine control hardware, the data, and the training system behind this crew. Until then, the safest thing we can do with the preliminary report is to treat it not as a mystery story, but as a warning. A reminder that even on a stable approach on a clear night in a familiar airplane, the weak links we don't see every day are the ones that can still hurt people on the ground.